Hello, and welcome to Baltimore's Inner Harbor. My name is Brian Auer. I'm the Operations Director with Historic Ships in Baltimore. In our collection with Historic Ships in Baltimore, we are the proud stewards of USS Constellation, which is over on Pier 1. And then behind me, the submarine USS Torsk, which is a World War II vintage American submarine. This structure that you're seeing sticking up, we call that the sail. And on the sail, there are a couple of things to point out. First off, the thing everyone wants to see on a submarine, up top there, we have two periscopes. One periscope is the attack periscope, one is the observation periscope. The whole reason a submarine exists is to be able to hide. And so the attack periscope has a very small profile to allow us to hide and be hard to detect with it sticking out of the water. We have our ship's logo that was designed by the crew during World War II, and the logo you're seeing there was updated in the 1950s. It was the job of one of our lieutenants, Lieutenant Hirschberger, to create an updated logo, and because he didn't have, he didn't feel he had the ability and the artistic merit to do that, he wrote to the Walt Disney Company, and the Walt Disney artists provided the updated logo that you see there on the bridge. Welcome aboard. We're now in the aft torpedo room aboard USS Torsk. So we're at the very back of the ship, and from this room, the aft torpedo room, USS Torsk sank the last two enemy ships during World War II. Specifically from this tube here, number seven. That was the tube that fired the last shots. From the rear, while submerged, and then hightailed it away from there so we weren't pursued or caught. So, aside from the torpedoes in this space, there's kind of one other thing in here that I like to point out that people don't often expect to find in the torpedo room, and it's up here. These are, in fact, bunks. They're racks for the crew to sleep because space is at a premium. So there was actually room in here for 12 to 18 people to berth. So we're now in the maneuvering room, and it's called that because we maneuver the electricity around the ship and control our propulsion. So this is where the gas pedal is. Her propulsion is diesel electric. So what does that mean? Well, just down the passage here, the next two compartments are our engine rooms. There's two engine rooms, each one has two engines, two Fairbanks Morse diesel engines. The diesel engines do not in any way connect to our propellers. Our propellers are powered by electrical motors. The electrical motors get their electricity from our power plant, which is those engines. From these two stations in the maneuver room, we control where that power is distributed. The sticks here, that's what they're called, they're actually just kind of bus switches. So I'm using these to switch electricity to different circuits, to either the motors, which are beneath our legs in the motor room, to actually increase the speed, we have to increase the power to the electric motors, which is done by upping the voltage. So we can up our voltage here, and then our motors speed increase and decrease are with these wheels here. So we're just turning the juice up, turning the juice down. That's what makes us go faster or slower. To know how fast we need to go, we would need to get orders from the conning tower, which is about 50 feet that direction and up a level. And to do that, like on most ships, we have our motor order telegraph, which is here. There is a duplicate device up in the conning tower and in the control room where the officer of the watch will issue a speed order. Right here next to me is the AC switchboard, so some of that electricity coming off of the DC generators is sent to motor generators beneath us and converted to AC current to power things like lights and small appliances. AC current is what you have in your house. So all the stuff that's for living and other small equipment is distributed here. So this is like the circuit breaker in your house right here. Over there we have the DC switchboard and that's mostly for the major equipment that runs off direct current. So the motors and other large equipment that would be running on that. But just forward of me here at the forward end of the engines we have our control stick, and there's three settings. We have start, stop, and run. So as I mentioned earlier, it's basically like a generator. We just turn it on, and once it's on, it starts generating electricity. And the only thing we have to do is turn it off when necessary, and make sure nothing goes wrong, which is what we use the instrument panels for uh, here and here. We're now standing in the after battery compartment on board Torsk, which is also serving as the crew's berthing. It's normally kept at low light like this, at least 
frequently kept at low light because the crew are working and sleeping in shifts. And so there's always going to be somebody trying to sleep in here at all hours of the day. So we keep the light low, that way people that are trying to sleep can do so. Meanwhile, there's enough light for the rest of the crew who are working to be able to get through and go on their way to their job stations. All right, it's chow time. We're now in the cruise mess on board USS Torsk. And this is the largest open space we have on board ship. The crew would eat in shifts in this space, 24 men at a time, that's six per table. We have four tables and they would have about 10 minutes to consume their meal and then move out so the next group could come in. All meals on board were prepared back here in the galley by the cook and served family style. So the plate would come out and it would pass table to table until it gets back here in the corner, which we call starvation corner because you're the last person to get the food. It's also being the largest space we have, the recreational area. So if you weren't in your bunk, you're gonna be in here. The control room on board Torsk is the spot we're in now. And this room is just beneath the conning tower. And it is where we control the angle and speed of the dive. This station right here controls the, the little fin-like wings that are on the outside of submarines. They help to point the bow or stern up or down. And we have a set forward and a set aft. So the forward wheel controls the forward dive planes. Same for the aft wheel, controls the aft dive planes. So we're using these wheels mostly to point the bow or the stern up or down so that we can use our forward propulsion to push us down. So rather than using our ballast to sink and submerge, the ballast mostly just gets us below the water. What actually moves us up or down once we're submerged is angling the bow and then using our propulsion to move through the waves like a fish, just like that, up and down. So above each wheel is our shallow depth gauge. So if you look at our shallow depth gauges, you'll see the calibrated for between zero and 165 feet deep. So that's pretty much where we're gonna be operating under most normal conditions, unless we have to do something extreme. To answer the question about how deep could the sub go, the answer I like to give comes from our deep depth gauge, which is right here, this brass one in the middle, and you can see that it's calibrated for a test depth of 600 feet, which tells me that at least with our gauge here, the sub was designed to go 600 feet deep. And then up here is the forward port station, which is used for controlling most of the portions of the dive. We have our hydraulic manifold here, which controls our hydraulic system to do things like raise and lower the periscopes, snorkel, opening doors and hatches against the sea pressure, and things that require a lot of force are all done with the hydraulic manifold. And finally, we have the auxiliary helm station, which essentially is a duplicate of the main helm station up in the conning tower directly above my head. So again, we have the rudder control here for left and right. We have our motor order telegraphs here for our communication and speed order changes to the maneuvering room, speedometer, gyro compass repeater, rudder indicators, the works. Everything's right here. We have this here just in case we lose the conning tower or it somehow becomes damaged and we can't use it. We have a spare essentially down here. From this position, we can also sound our klaxon alarm, which is the signal that we're getting ready to dive or surface. And the last thing we can do in the control room is rig for red, where essentially our lights go down and we bring up the red lights. And what the red light allows us to do is uh, it makes for easy surfacing in the dark. So if we come up at night, having red light on makes it so that our eyes are already pre-adjusted to the darkness. So we're not going from a really brightly lit interior into total darkness and we're, we have temporary light blindness. All right, so we're now entering the conning tower. This room was the command center for the submarine. This is where the captain would be stationed. So behind me, you have main rudder control right here. So this is where the helmsman would be stationed, turning the sub and doing some maneuvering. And then right here, we have our torpedo fire control. Torpedoes are not fired from the torpedo rooms themselves. Their fire control is controlled from here in the conning tower where our targeting is done. And so we have our bank of switches for the aft torpedo room where we have four tubes. And then we have six tubes for the forward torpedo room. So you would activate which tubes you're getting ready to fire. And then the fire button, just punch it and the torpedo goes on its way. Here at the aft end of the conning tower, we have a couple of interesting things. First of all, I mentioned the attack periscope, which is right here. This is where we would target the enemy ship. And 
the captain could make adjustments to the handles to adjust the range and height of the target, which then is repeated back here. So the crewman could take the settings and plug them into the TDC or torpedo data computer to um, a bunch of rotary dials. And as you dial everything in, other dials change and spit out your settings for your torpedo attack, your angle of attack, your spread, and so forth, which you can then send to the torpedo rooms where they plug them in the torpedoes and then fire your spread so you don't have to waste torpedoes. Reached our last stop here, which is the forward torpedo room. Up there is the very front most compartment of the ship. And the forward torpedo room is pretty much the same as the aft torpedo room. The main difference is here we have six tubes rather than just four that we had back aft. So we can fire a spread of six torpedoes from the forward torpedo room. And remember, each torpedo is several thousand pounds. So if we fire a spread of torpedoes, we launch three or four of them from our forward room, all of a sudden we are six, eight, even 10,000 pounds lighter. So the front of the ship's gonna wanna start to float. So we have to make compensation for that in the control room so that we don't start surfacing when we're in the middle of an attack. So it's a pretty complicated procedure taking care of these torpedoes. The other rules still apply. We still have bunks in here, just like back aft. So men would be sleeping in here while others are working. And you're not necessarily a torpedo men when you're bunked in here. You could just be the cook or something and you'd have your berth assigned in here so people are working while you're trying to sleep. I hope you enjoyed this virtual look at USS Torsk. Submarine Torsk served in the Navy admirably for 23 years, during which time she began her service right at the tail end of World War II in the last seven months or so of the war. And then the rest of her service happened during the Cold War. And during that time, she served as a training ship for the next generation of submarine sailors and took a pivotal role in preparing the next generation of Navy personnel who wear the dolphin emblem for submarine service. But I hope that we'll get to welcome you on board for a visit in person where you can experience for yourself what it was like to serve on one of these World War II era vessels. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this look and I hope to see you on board in the future.